Um, well, I'm going to make a couple of assumptions before we get started. All right. One is that everybody in this room is contemplating some sort of big change. Right. Um, two is that you've either read the bios of our panelists here, or you trust us that they've made a similar change. Okay. And uh, and and so that we've got the experts here. We've got the people with experience. So they're the assumptions that I'm going to make. Um, we do certainly have some things to talk about, but before we launch into that, what I'd like to hear is what are the topics, what are the questions or the themes that you have? So instead of us spouting out and then opening it up for questions, and certainly we'll be here afterwards, and you can ask people individual questions uh, afterwards, but why don't you tell me up front what kind of things you want to hear? So this is a little bit of a flipped classroom concept, and now you're all in the hot seat. So are there themes or questions? Who's got, who's got some questions that they think they might have? I want to hear about startup capital. It's okay. something that's um, been not really talked about all day in the other entrepreneurial sessions. Okay. Got it. Anybody else? Uh, I guess to have a partner or not have a partner. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Any other brave souls? Original business plan versus challenges encountered in the first three months, six months, nine months that were unexpected. Got it. Mm, no, this is my <laughs> cheat sheet. Um, mm -hmm. Once you make the jump from a really stable, lucrative uh, position, or <laughs> to don't do it. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> By the way, we only have 45 minutes, but keep going. <laughs> uh, okay, well, let, thank you. Let's get started with that. And there are some other things that we probably will cover in the course. Um, let me quickly cool. introduce who we have. <laughs> Emily Hughes, Siobhan Walsh, and um, um, Marion. Marion. I, no, I want to get the, the whole you name. Fraterolo Solino. That was awesome. Yes, wow. thank you. Thank you. So let's, you know, why don't we start talking about funding right, right away and um, give us a, a flavor for how you found financing, the importance of it, what happened when you went initially for financing, and what happened when you were down the road a little bit. So Emily, I'll look at you first. Sure. So I'm not going to be any help because we don't have investors, but um, I run a consultancy, so we're client funded. So we've always been profitable from the beginning, but it's a different amount of money that we work with each month, depending on the clients and the scope of work that we're dealing with. And however much money we have coming in determines how many people we can employ and what we can provide them. And otherwise, how much falls onto us. So I would say before you start anything, even if you have the next Facebook as your idea, um, figure out your monetization plan. Because if you, it's not going to fund itself. <laughs> and uh, if you're not making money off it immediately or uh, down the line, there's just no point in doing it. It'll be very stressful. But I don't know if you guys have investors. Yeah, yeah. no, I have a similar, um, I have a marketing consultancy. So it's very much client funded, right? Client fed. Um, which means when you're the ones who's eating last, sometimes you don't eat as much, right? So you have to look at what your contracts are, your clients are, um, if you have subcontractors, anyone helping you, and then you kind of get the last, you know, the leftovers, right? Um, so uh, and, uh, touching a little bit on one of the questions that I had, I think it was your question about when to make the leap. For me, it was, um, and I was very lucky, I realized this, but having um, almost a strategic investor in someone who has, knows me well and said, have you ever thought about going out on your own because I'll give you your first contract. So there's a few different ways that you can think about that. And um, I was talking to a graphic designer the other day who was saying, I actually kind of positioned it to my existing company by saying, you spend X for me. You'd be spending less. Would you consider being my first client? And then obviously be scaling. He can then go and kind of go out and get other clients too. So sometimes it's a relationship that will work for both. Um, and it's just a creative way for you to kind of get that started without having that scary, like, oh, no moment, right? So you can kind of have a, at least a pathway or a runway for it. Marion, how about you? Well, I, for us and uh, my partner and husband, Paul, who's the Villanova graduate here, um, I'm Temple 84. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we started nonprofit organizations. So I don't know if that makes everybody want to leave the room. Um, but essentially, we're all paying in terms of for non nonprofit um, startups and organizations. But for Paul and I, we had worked together 
um, at a legacy organization supporting people with intellectual disabilities, and this is kind of post the deinstitutionalization movement in the 1970s. Um, and so we were helping people live in group homes and, and kind of move from institutions into the community. Uh, and we did that for a while, and then listening to people and their families and really looking at the situation, thinking this is really um, a big waste of taxpayer dollars in, in many ways. We can think of a better way to do it. How are we going to do it? Because there is no startup funding, per se, with government. Um, we decided to remortgage our home and start it. That's how much we believed in what we were doing. Um, and the environment through Medicaid contracts is fee-for-service. So all we needed was a few brave people, um, and I make it sound easy, but there, there were several people with disabilities who had known Paul and I and said, we're going to make the jump to your organization. So with a little bit of that um, and a little bit of people in local city government believing um, in what we wanted to do, uh, and they were able to give us some advance on contracts, we were able to get started. So I think um, my lesson in that is where there's a will, there's a way. Um, and that if you really want to do it, there's ways to do it. It's often going to be very non-traditional, um, and it's going to be risky. But I mean, I think you're sitting in this room because you're either prepared for risk or you're, you're maybe knee deep in it and want to wait a little bit more. You know, there was an, the second question or the second issue was about partnerships. And, and Emily, you and Siobhan mentioned that you're client funded. So talk a little bit about uh, kind of a two-part question here. Talk a little bit about the importance and function of partnerships, both from the standpoint of a business partner and also from the standpoint of some of your vendor partnerships. Sure. So um, I, I'm going to backtrack a little on this. I'll also kind of answer your question about when to make a jump. But I used to work in corporate company and then um, worked for a celebrity run company and hated it. <laughs> and I to keep myself happy, I started consulting on the side, and eventually that money on the side matched what I was making at my company, and, and that's when I told them, see you later, and I started my own company. Um, so I was consulting by myself for a little and had so many questions and so many thoughts and just needed someone to bounce stuff by, and an old boss of mine, her name's Kristen, um, she had her third kid at the time. She was an executive director at Time Inc., and, didn't want to be doing the commute anymore and get home after her kids were asleep already and only see them on the weekend. So I was like, why don't you just try this one client with me? And then one client became two and two became eight and, <laughs> and all of a sudden we were partners. So I, I think it's so valuable to have a partner, um, especially if you're really aware of what your strengths and weaknesses are. For me, for example, I am a risk taker. I like running 100 miles an hour. I'm really impulsive. I have a temper. <laughs> I sound like a great person that you all want to get to know right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm hyper, hyper organized. And Kristen, on the other hand, thinks big picture. And she looks five years down the road. And she is super rational and always eager to compromise, um, well as I will get my back up against the wall. And But she is the least organized human being I've ever met. So um, together we meet in the middle. And that has always proved successful for us. Um, the other thing to think about when you're uh, bringing out a partner is um, how do you work with that person? So you need to be able to be really candid um, with that person and be able to argue with them. And if you can't, you're going to have conflicts, you're going to have situations that you want to tackle differently, and if you can't talk it out and then move on to the next thing and go get coffee, you can't be partners. It's just, you can't get catty about it. Um, in terms of vendors, so we work with a bunch of different vendors, both on the client side and then in-house, uh, and I think the most important ones are uh, vendors that give you some process to run your company, so whether it's like we use a tool called Asana, if any of you use that, and it's how we delegate to our um, various contractors and employees. Um, we, are, we just switched our payroll system, we're looking into a benefit system, all these different things, and um, getting to know them and uh, getting that support and building that relationship is so crucial because it's the only way you can run a company. Yeah, I would say um, exactly what you were saying about balancing strengths and weaknesses, right? So um, I work a lot with a mentor of mine who has now become a friend and kind of partner. And she's really, she's more senior, but she's really good about big picture things. And I'm kind of the execution arm, right? So we kind of work together really well. Um, but she's been at really big corporate 
environments, knows them, knows how to navigate them well, whereas I've always kind of worked at smaller, startup-y kind of places, and she'll, she, she kind of knows the honeypots that you might get stuck in, right? <laughs> um, which has been really good. And then also what I would say is just another kind of to, to tuck under your bonnet when you're thinking about it is a lot, I've gotten a lot of help from um, some of the agencies that I used to hire, right? So they were entrepreneurial, right? They decided to go off on their own. And so I'd say, you know, what do you do for payroll? Or how do you find good people? Or what do you do for creative or something? Because usually, because we're all in this room, we're all looking to share experiences anyway. But I've found that they're really good resources for, because they've already kind of navigated that. And they're at their next inflection point. So they're at the 50 person, and I'm at the one and a half person, right? So mm -hmm. um, so they can kind of give you a lay of the land of what you may not know what to expect, but also to kind of give you uh, some help along the way, which has been really useful. And then uh, then I brought them in as, as vendors myself. So like it's kind of come full circle where I was the client, and now I'm the agency, and then you're the client again. And I think it's more about the people that you trust that you'll do business with. And um, you know, I've I teach as an adjunct on the side. and. You know, I think a lot about business is relationships and communications, and people want to do business with people they like. So, as long as you're authentic and you're, you know, kind of, I think they'd they'd like to try and find a way to work with you if if they can. To so partner up. Yeah. yeah. Marion, I'm going to switch it a little bit on you and, mm -hmm. and not have you pick on your business partner who happens <laughs> to be your husband. But talk a little Very bit about, you know, you you got started in dealing with a lot of these agencies. So in a way, it's almost like a. Uh, vendor relationship. So talk about the importance of, of that kind of partnership. Well, it's interesting. As, as you both were talking, I was thinking, wow, all of our customers are really seen as partners, too. Um, and I think on, uh, initially you may say, well, wait a second, if you're dealing with people with intellectual disabilities, how well is that going to work? Um, and it actually works really well. Um, it does, because a lot of the data, if you will, that we get is, is, is raw. Um, and, it's, and it's very real time, and it's very, are you meeting my needs at this particular time? Um, and so I think that the idea of seeing everyone as a potential partner in some way is really a lesson that we continue to learn. Um, Nancy spoke um, at, the, at the previous um, session, and she's my best friend, and also, of course, Villanova. Um, <laughs> um, in her industry, with the, the newspapers, um, there's still this argument that somehow print newspapers are coming back, right? And so I used to think, wow, Nancy and I work in this really disparate fields, and you know, I'm so lucky to have a friendship, but we really don't have anything professional in common. And wow, has that changed in the last several years. So in the disability services field, we are undergoing significant change in moving from legacy organizations where facilities and nursing homes and institutions and group homes are now giving way to this next generation of kids who are going to typical schools and they're in regular classrooms. So when they graduate, the last thing they want is to go across town or across the county to a group home or a facility. And we are continually amazed that we are like the only organization in Pennsylvania, believe it or not, that supports people with intellectual disabilities exclusively in their own homes and communities. Hmm. So when we say other agencies, while I want them to be our partners, we are often seen as the radicals hmm. and the rebels. And really, we're saying, but we're just doing what it is people want. Hmm. And how do we know that? Because we see our customers as our partners. So we make it a rule that we have to get input and feedback in real time from people who are actually using our mm -hmm. services. Mm -hmm. And the other partner um, that I think is often overlooked are the employees. So we really look at our workforce as some of our most important partners. And we see them also as secondary customers. Because if we don't, we know that they can't possibly do their job well if they don't feel that they're treated well. So I think for us, the lesson is that everybody is a potential partner and should be. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the, the next topics was just the issue of challenges. And what I'm going to do is, because this is a women's leadership summit, what I'd like to do is talk about some of the specific challenges that you've encountered um, as a woman launching a business and running a business. And Joan, why don't we start with you? Um, I, I would say one of the challenges and kind of lessons learned, um, and I don't know if it's they always say there's a little bit of imposter syndrome around women and we kind of know things inherently that we, not that we don't believe we know, but we're just not as brash about it. Um, one of the things I learned was I knew more than I thought I did, right? Going, coming out of the gate and I was kind of like, okay, you know, if you think of a lot of it, 
unless you're brain surgeons, and if we have any in the house, great. You do great work, and you should have all of that training. Um, but you know, you're like, this isn't rocket science. Like, there's a way to figure this no, because out. Because it's brain surgery. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Touche. Touche. <laughs> but I often was like, you know, people before me. I've seen some real dummies that are very successful Des billi despite billionaires themselves. despite yeah. themselves. So I was like, I think so we can figure that, that out. Everybody? Yes. Okay. I'm constantly like, or not my clients that I really, really like, but some clients I'm like, I would love to have your job. Yeah. I don't know what you yeah, do yeah, all day because I'm doing it all and then charging you for it. But um, So I think coming out of the gate, it was um, like kind of carving out a little space, being like, I know more than I thought I did just from being in a corporate environment, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and that, uh, I also felt that in business school, like there was a few times where I kind of was like, oh, huh, I didn't even know I knew that so much. Are right? there, so. So, so what type of challenges, if you, like what keeps you up at night? What are the things that are just, wow, um, this is crushing. Uh, one, I think one thing, and I don't know if you feel the same way about being kind of client fed, is um, it's, it's this, well, you have to be comfortable with kind of peaks and valleys, right? Mm -hmm. So as your contracts, you hope your clients pay their bills on time, and all of you who are clients, please pay your bills on time, because <laughs> we're trying to manage from that, right? So I have a really big client right now that, you know, as a billion dollar publicly traded firm, you would think they would pay their bills in 30 days and they want 90 day terms, right? And you're kind of going, well, 90 day terms, that means I'm floating everything for 90 yeah. days, including all of the contractors that are gonna be working on this project, right? So. Um, so be comfortable with the peaks and valleys and kind of be a little squirrel and save the stuff that you have because you may plan and, and through no fault of your own, your client may have budget and may be pulled or stalled and then you have a little bit of a gap so you kind of have to manage for that. And I think that's probably what keeps me up is knowing that, you know, that's just kind of a chain from there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Marion, how about you? Um, and challenges. it is the two-parter. It's, the, two -parter. it's, the, it's the, the general challenges right. and then the challenges as a woman. Well, as you probably can already see, I have a real issue with being um, accused of being aggressive. I define it as assertive. Um, so I, I think, too, that's probably true of, of many women, especially if you do know the most in the room. Um, and the room, sorry, gentlemen here. But you know, a lot, a lot of the boardrooms, even in disability services, where the workforce is predominantly women, the leaders are men. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I was also young when I, when I was promoted into leadership positions. So I kind of had that double edge of having to, to prove that I knew something. Um, and I don't know that that ever really goes away. I mean, I think we, we stand on a lot of people's shoulders and, and women, the next generation coming after us will stand on ours. Gloria Steinem says, um, I don't want to pass the torch. I want, I want mine to light the next, the next one. So I think it, it's really something all of us are going to have to continue to work towards. Um, but I think otherwise, being a nonprofit in this political and economic environment, um, that's the kind of stuff that keeps me up at night is in order to continue to innovate, we are always on the edge, so to speak. Um, we could very easily turn back and become very traditional and probably be pretty safe for the next several years. Um, but that's not, that's not what we're here to do. So those are, mm -hmm. those are the things that we're continually mm -hmm. kind of at the table about. Yeah. How, how about, do we continue how about you, to balance? I have a lot to say about this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so first, uh, as a woman, um, we definitely have had clients, and I say past tense because we got rid of them, but um, who uh, spoke down to us, didn't treat us as thought leaders, tried to um, pay us less than our worth because we were women, um, or were just really misogynistic and awful. And um, it's not, when you run your own company, you get to choose who you work with. Mm -hmm. That's not the person I'm going to work with. On the other hand, we have had um, clients who have come to us and said, we love that you're a women-run business, and we just know that you're going to get it. Like, women just get it. And there's a more collaborative approach. There's a more thoughtful approach um, because we're women-run. Um, so that it's a strength also to be a woman. Um, we have a lot of clients that are uh, funded by investors, and we help them kind of deal with the venture capitalists. And um, sexism is a real thing, and sexual harassment is a real thing, and uh, especially in Silicon Valley. And mm -hmm. Um, once someone has a part of your business, it's, it's scary. I, I was just at the Forbes Under 30 conference. They had two entire panels just with women who have filed lawsuits because of sexual harassment against their venture capitalists. So um, that's something to just be wary of. Also, women are uh, much less likely to get funding. 
Um, you have to be twice as good, twice as prepared. So, and I think that's across industry. Um, and then things that keep me up at night. Um, I think definitely the, the funding, you know, we're the last ones to get paid. So if a client doesn't pay or disappears or whatever, um, it ends up hurting us. Um, I think also wanting to know more. So, you know, you start a company and you think, I'm, I'm gonna be doing digital marketing and that's it and I know how to do that. Turns out you're also doing the legal contracts mm -hmm. and the HR and the financial planning <laughs> and the taxes. And even if you're outsourcing some of these things, you have to understand it because it's your business. And I didn't know any of that coming into it. So I am constantly feeling like I'm on this learning curve and trying to catch up. So um, just be prepared for that if you I'd say a lot of my team. I'll have my, my legal team, <laughs> that, yeah. my finance team. <laughs> and I was kind of like, Do you change I feel your like voice I have multiple personalities because my team, I was like, oh, I'll have the, yeah, my legal team will look at that. <laughs> okay, put the phone down and yeah. I'm like reading through it. Um, but so, coming from a corporate job too, I feel the same way. Uh, I'm still in touch with you know some of the people that I used to work with and one was the lawyer and I said, you know, I owe you an apology <laughs> because I used to always think you just slowed everything down and you didn't get you like we were always had to go oh you have to go through chat and everyone's like oh like we had a chat legal too. is the black hole that everything sits in and now when you're spending 300 bucks an hour to have legal look at something you're like oh I really wish I'd have a lawyer on staff yeah. that yeah. can do that right so I think there's um there's a, a tipping point where you're kind of comfortable with a little bit of risk right but not you know, I can read some contracts and sign them, and then um, and then there are others that I'm kind of like I need to have like the. So let's the broaden that a little bit it. because you used the word tipping point, and one of the questions was when do you jump, right? So talk a little bit about your advice on when do you jump, and maybe baked in there. Again, I'm giving multiple part questions sure. here, <laughs> but maybe baked in there is. What are the, the one or two lessons learned? Like, what would you do the same? What would you do differently? Okay. Um, what was the first part of the two parts? <laughs> <laughs> it was so long a question, I forget. No, what's the tipping point? Right, right? the tipping point. Um, I, and I realize this is a great, I, if you can do this, the best thing is to try to, you know, they call it a side hustle for a reason, right? So if you can kind of bump along as much as you can, and there are certain careers that I think that lends that to, you can freelance on the side, right? Um, I was uh, like, went out for coffee dates with everyone kind of in my space to be like, is this something that's, you know, how are you finding it? What are you doing? And, and I found that a lot of entrepreneurs are really happy to kind of share their secret sauces and be very supportive. Um, I was fortunate in that it was kind of, it was just that we were talking about like the universes were colliding all at the same time where I had, you know, someone who was willing to kind of be my first benefactor, right? While I could go out and sell more work, I could keep the lights on and then I can kind of go out and sell more work. So for me, it was more of like, can I do this? And then I thought, you know, when you look at what if, right? What's the worst that can happen? And then that usually doesn't happen, right? As women, I think we plan for a lot of scenarios. Um, so what's the worst, worst, worst that can happen is like, okay, well, I go bankrupt and I have to move in with my parents, right? Not ideal. My mom's here. I wouldn't actually mind that. that much. But, um, we can see if we can edit that up. But, yeah. <laughs> But working back from that, okay, that's probably not going to happen. The worst case is maybe the client doesn't pay all the contract. Like there's a lot of kind of wiggle room. So if you can, um, you know, it, if you're looking for a kind of a career change that you can do it kind of on the side and get a real, you know, a, and a warts and all look at it too, right? Um, so to be able to ask people in, in your network and your circle that can do so, it. So you did a lot of um, networking. You did a lot of sort of risk analysis in a way. What would you do differently? Um, I probably would have jumped sooner, to be honest, because yeah. we were saying, and I don't know if, so if any of you have this. Yeah, 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 I know. <laughs> the, the I quit emails just started being drafted. Um, <laughs> I was in we have a, a template in a room over room. all the distance <laughs> after. That's part of our handouts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was in a role that I had outgrown at a company that I had kind of outgrown, and you know, the market wasn't great for jobs there, so I think it was like 2008, 2009, you were kind of happy just to have a job, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, and for whatever reason, marketing is always the first department to get cut, the budgets to get cut. Um, as a marketer, I don't really agree with that decision, but there's nothing you can really control. 
So I probably had 12 months that I could have done it sooner mm -hmm. and was always like, eh, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. And then kind of needed that external push. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that would probably be, yeah, doing it sooner because I can kind of see life on the other side. Yeah. So Marion, for you, what's, what was the tipping point or what do you suggest for others should be the tipping point and tell what, you know, you would do again and what you would do differently. Okay. So I probably wouldn't advise you to do what I did, which was well, I was working for my in-laws. So that's a, that's a whole other talk. Um, so it was, it was basically a family disagreement that happened in the boardroom. Um, and I'm impulsive too. <laughs> so thankfully, Paul's the one with the good head on his shoulders. Um, so I was like, I'm out, you know, because we had we had gone through this business transformation planning. We had invested a lot of time. We'd made a lot of promises to people we were working for and their families about making the change. Um, and then the board was like, oh well, no, we were just kind of kidding about that. Just proceed on with what you were doing. Right. And I was like, nope, not here. Um, and you know, initially when when I quit or was fired, there's different versions of that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, depending on who you talk to. Um, you know, it, it was just, it, it kind of happened, but I think, I, I don't know who to subscribe to or ascribe this quote to, but it's leap and the net will appear. Um, and, that's, and that's what happened. Um, and it's continued to happen um, throughout the course of the, of the organizations that Paul and I have started, which is now a network of nonprofit organizations um, and growing. Um, and so, that's the one part of the. So what would price. you do differently? I don't think I would do anything differently, <laughs> actually. Mm -hmm. um, maybe a little bit sooner, but I think we gave it our all, and I think that's what you know good responsible business people do. Is you know you, you're hired to do a job, uh, you put your all into it, and you do the best that you can do. And when your best isn't good enough, or your best isn't appreciated at mm -hmm. a particular place anymore, it's time it's time to move on. So. I don't know. I don't think I would really do anything differently. Okay. Paul probably has a much different version. Yeah. Because he's the Paul? same. <laughs> yeah. Well, we might have to get a chair for you up there. Emily, how about you? I didn't realize that you're Paul. You oh, asked sorry. the partnership question, right? <laughs> no. Oh, you are. Oh, I was like, <laughs> oh, yeah. I was like, were you voting? It was a loaded question. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, Paul. Um, so I, I mean, I mentioned that I did this as a side hustle, and then. Um, kind of leapt into it, but the other part to think about is just the lifestyle that you want, and uh, one of the big factors for me starting my business was um, my mother was really sick, and I was in hospitals all the time, and I was home, and it was really hard to be in an office, especially at a company that was not supportive of that. They wanted me to be in every meeting, and meetings I didn't have to be in, and um, so I finally was like, screw this. Like, yeah. I need the flexibility, yeah. and like my life priorities are mom above mm -hmm. the rest of my work, so um, that was a, a big part of it, and uh, while it never turns off <laughs> once you quit, it's 24-7, you can be here doing this mm -hmm. today, or you can work from a beach somewhere, yeah. or you know, the flexibility is great. Um, so that is something to think about when you want to take the leap. If, if the job is just killing you, it's not worth it. That's my thought in life. Um, what I would do differently. I think I would, tr I would want to have a better sense of what I'm capable of. And we kind of, we were talking, we just fell into this and First I was just consulting, and then I had a partner, and then, oh, we need a name for this business. Well, maybe we just file for an LLC while we're naming it, and, oh, we need to start hiring. We need, you know, you just, it kind of just stumbled into it, and I think if I had gone into it with the goal of, I want to be, have seven figures of revenue mm -hmm. by the end of my first year, yeah, and I would have purpose planned yeah. accordingly, yeah. you know? So that invokes one of the other questions is, you apparently didn't have a business plan. No. Okay. <laughs> no. Let's say hypothetically that you did. I was a little nervous what, that you asked that. What did it look like when you thought about this idea, and what did it look like a year later? Now it's a very serious business plan, and um, when we started, it was just you flying by the seat of your pants, and thank God it worked out. But um, we have a financial advisor now, an amazing accountant, and a whole team that we meet with and say, are we doing our taxes properly? If we want to bring this person on, what do we pay them and what can we offer them and how does that affect the business and where are we getting our clients from and there's a whole strategy to it and revenue goals attached to it and um, I just wish I had done that in January 2016 <laughs> instead yeah, of right. now. So um, as much planning as you can do and plan big, you know, if shoot for it. I, I am a firm believer that there's no 
such thing as um, growth. You can't have a growth and comfort at the same time. You mm -hmm. have to be uncomfortable and take risks. So, um, you know, I, my business partner and I were talking the other day, and we were like, well, how much do you think the company is going to grow? And she was like, I don't know, maybe maybe ten percent, and I was like, ten percent? Like, <laughs> we are doubling next yeah. year, you know. So I always feel like go big, and yeah. if you fall short, at least you went for it. Yeah. Siobhan, did you have a business plan? Uh, no, not okay. really. But I do think uh, I wouldn't necessarily advocate that. But I do think you can back into. I think it takes a little bit of time to figure out what you can make, mm -hmm. right? So I think you can kind of, even if you don't have a business plan, back into it a little later and say, okay, well, people normally spend, if I want to be a wedding planner, people normally spend $25,000 for a wedding. So mm -hmm. how many weddings would I have to book? And almost kind of back calculate it. So, um, but you must have had some notion, right? So you didn't have a formal business plan per se, but you must have had some notion. And what was different a year out from what your notion was, right? Uh, to what it actual was? Uh, I would say the first year is definitely just learning in general, exactly what we were saying, like write a proposal and you're going, oh, okay. I'll just Google proposals, right? And you're like, okay, I'll just start writing a proposal. Um, so for a, there's a, like a little bit of wasted time there, I would say, just trying to kind of get your head around exactly benefits and taxes and you, uh, you, know, you have to pay estimated taxes, so you have to pay what you think you're gonna make, which you're like, well, estimated, 30% of zero is going to be a big fat zero <laughs> right now. So, yeah. um, But I would say after that, you can really start to think about where you can grow. And so I did have a few people that I work predominantly in technology, not all in technology, but uh, in technology marketing. And I knew a few people who had kind of gotten, you know, moved out on their own from big corporate jobs and were making, you know, $10 million, I mean, revenue wise, I don't mm -hmm. know what they were actually taking home, but we're doing quite well. And I, and I was kind of like, well, I can do that. You know, mm -hmm. I can do what they're doing because I worked on the same team. So I kind of had a few anecdotal examples yeah. that yeah. I knew I would be able to pull from. Mm -hmm. uh, Marion, I'm going to guess based on your comments that you yourself did not create the business plan, but that your business partner did. You would be right. And on so that. was there... I can't believe I'm the only one on this panel who can actually say, I did have a plan. Well, let's hear, <laughs> let's hear about it. What... what um, what was your, you know, what was the difference a year out from your original notion? Oh, I think we blew it out in like the first six months because mm. once people started hearing about us and hearing how different we were, we like the phones were just blowing up, people were showing up. We didn't have an office, so it was in our in our dining room essentially, and all of our kids were under three. So if you didn't think I was crazy at yeah. that time, <laughs> uh, we did all this with, you know, uh, Gianna was three and two or four, and the twins were two. So it was crazy. It was cr absolute madness and a chocolate lab. So just imagine, <laughs> imagine that craziness. But yeah, we, we did. We had a plan, and it was, it was thanks to Paul that we did that. So it was both. It was strategic and tactical because we, we knew in our minds, you know, what, what's the end game, and we knew that because of the real time data that we, yeah. we yeah. had were getting. Um, and then we put some numbers to that, um, and we had people come along. Um, who agreed there were four of us that didn't get paid for the first six months, but we were committed to saying in that six months, we're going to make sure that we're going to pay really good people who are going to do the direct service piece of the work, which is the heart and soul of, of what we do. Um, and, you know, the first year it was, we need office space. Uh, we need to bring on some more folks. We need to bonus the people who didn't get paid for the first six months because we want to keep them. Um, and, you know, we're 13 years out now. Um, and we are considered one of the subject matter experts in disability supports, not just here, but across the country. Um, so there's, there's a lot to be said for you know, having a plan, but also framing a plan, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. in the first, mm -hmm. in the first and, six and months or year. Plan. Now we pay a facilitator to come in who, mm -hmm. who actually facilitates a strategic plan. We do an executive leadership retreat. So it's, it's much more formal. Well, and um, I think it's just point, negotiating right? what's in bounds and what's out of bounds, exactly. right? Yeah. And what you can give on and what you can't give yep. on, right? So income and clients, you probably can't, but there are certain things that you go, okay, maybe that goes to year two or year three. Right. Or, you know, you're, you're invoking another concept, and I think the word is balance. <laughs> so, you know, you mentioned sick parents and children. And so how, when you're running at 100 miles an hour, how do you establish some sense of balance, uh, you know, mentally, physically, spiritually, all that. Mary, why don't we start with you? 
Well, for the moms in the room, make sure you know where your mute button is. So when you're screaming at the kids while you're facilitating a conference call, yeah. <laughs> nobody can hear it because I made the mistake of turning it off when I should have been turning it on. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think if you're really, and I, I think if you're in this room, then you're probably people who you don't have that kind of 50-50 where I'm turning it off at 5 o'clock or, yep. you know, I start up at Monday at 9. You know, that being said, you, you have to find a balance, but I think, it's, I think it's a highly individualized thing. And I think that I can go 100 miles an hour um, and, and be up and, and trying to make the kids, you know, breakfast, and they don't even want me in the kitchen anymore, but I want to make it for them anyway, um, to picking them up after school, uh, to, to spending Saturdays at field hockey tournaments, right, when I should be writing another proposal. Um, and then there's times where I just have to say, you know what, I need to go away for like three days or I need to just not do it. Um, and I think one of you said it earlier, you know, there's a lot that you put in and a lot of responsibility, obviously, because it's yours. But at the same time, there's flexibility built in because you make sure that your priorities really are the priorities mm -hmm. as much mm -hmm. as you can, you can do it. But I'm not going to say it's easy. I mean, I love my kids so much because they... They get me. It's like they were born to be with me. They understand when I'm when I'm gone for three or four days, um, and they also understand when I'm like, please don't fight right now. You know what I mean? Right. Like I just can't take it anymore. Um, so if it wasn't for them, I just I don't know that I I certainly wouldn't be sitting here. So they're a big part of yeah. helping me. There you go. I think um, you need to prioritize, just like you said, a little time for yourself, right? And whatever that might be. So maybe it's getting a manicure or it's going for a run. I actually do a lot of good thinking through things when I'm going for a run. Uh, or if you just need to blow off steam, you go to a spin class, right? So we have the luxury, and if you're looking to launch a business that you have to be on site somewhere, that might not be as feasible. But we have the luxury of being able to work from a lot of places, right? So. Um, and when you work in an office, you often have a coffee break or a chatty colleague or somebody who comes and wanders in. And maybe you take that mind break that you need. And when you're working, sometimes I work from home or I work from client sites where you're with the client the whole day. I mean, you need a drink by the end of the day, right? <laughs> so it's one of those things like where you, if you <laughs> finished, and it's kind of a nice, you know, it's, you've, you've worked to earn that. but. You know, you've worked heads down on something and you finish and you hand it to the client and there's nothing else you can do, there's nothing else you can do. And at three o'clock, your day is done because you usually probably have started earlier. You started at 7 a.m. And if you work from home, you're in your pajamas, right? You put your cup of coffee, your pot of coffee on and you start doing emails, right? Um, so you have to give yourself a little permission to claw back a little bit of time because there's a lot of you know, FaceTime in the office or whatever that happens that you don't have, right? So you don't often have someone, and if you do, you have other problems wandering through your house, like distracting you, right? So you have to kind of make those distractions, and, and I live in Manhattan, so it was, you know, I realized it was a winter day, and I it was freezing outside, and I was like, well, I don't need to go out, and I was in dark to dark, right? And I thought, well, this is unhealthy, right? So making time, whether it's just walking around the block, going get a coffee, something to kind of keep stimulated, but also take a break, um, because it can be a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm really bad at it, so I don't have a lot of great <laughs> advice. <laughs> um, but I, I was joking, not joking, I was completely <clears throat> honest, but I was saying to someone before that there are multiple days a week where I'm like, did I shower today? Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, have I changed my clothes today? Because <laughs> like, I work from home, so there's no end to my day. Um, but I think, I think the way to think about it is you will not work less. If anything, you will work more, but you will work on your time. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go and speak at Villanova for the day, fine. Like the emails mm -hmm. will wait. Um, if you need to like go get a manicure mm -hmm. or deal with a sick parent or whatever it is, pick up your kids from school, you have the flexibility mm -hmm. to do that because no one is like stalking you down. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think it's just so important to set boundaries for yourself. So my goal in life is to have one day a week where I am not on my phone. I'm not looking at email. I'll tell you when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> it's still not achieved. Not achieved, yeah. Good luck with that. Um, if I make like an hour, I'm like, that was a great hour. <laughs> and I, like for me, I, I love my dog. I take really long walks with my dog and I love to travel. So I try to take a big trip once a quarter and I can do some work from that mm -hmm. trip. But just having that to look forward to and knowing it's just a change of scenery is everything for me. So 
Um, and I'm what I, I, that's hard still. Like I think we've uh, we've been a little conditioned to you know when you're at the office you're at the office when you leave the office you mm -hmm. leave the office right. So when your office is your home or you're always at the office in your mind, it's tough to have that break. So you know I have a friend who lives a block from the beach in San Diego, and I was like, why don't I just go for a week and yeah. just go work mm -hmm. if I can work anywhere? And I'm yeah. still not great at that, so I think right. that's going to be on my list for next. No, year. I, I think this picking up and make it make a difference. You just like, get a new perspective yeah, on things and the things that yeah. you thought were difficult. You kind of go, oh, okay, and yeah. you know you can really work from anywhere, which is nice. So. Right. so somewhat related to the concept of perspective, where do you find inspiration and continued guidance? Go ahead, Emily. Me? Okay. You can <laughs> I think talking to people. So I, I you know, worked in magazines. I worked at um, Goop, um, Gwyneth Paltrow's company, and um, you make a ton of connections there. And just keeping up with them and saying, well, what, what are you guys doing now? Or like, how how are you growing your Instagram account? And um, going to conferences and hearing from all you guys and um, talking to. Uh, I mean, reading. Um, I read a certain number of newsletters every day that are uh, industry related, and that, that keeps me going. And then probably the most abnormal one is um, I like stalk my little cousin who's 18 and in college and like college kids know everything these days. <laughs> so I'm like, what messaging apps are you using and what are you posting on Facebook? Oh, you're not on Facebook. Yeah, are you on Snapchat? Snapchat? What are you doing <laughs> on Snapchat? Where do you get your news? Like I just need to know everything. Um, so I feel like the more you talk to people, the more you network, the more you read. How about you, Sean? Um, I would say, and this is probably maybe in your year two business plan, but to try and really um, recruit like a personal board of advisors, right? So, and it should be someone who you've, you've managed, someone who's managed you, right? I've had bosses that have become mentors, that have become friends, clients that have been, become friends, but people that know you from different snippets of your life because you know, they know when you're unhappy and when you're happy and can kind of help you because you feel like, you know, sometimes you just feel like, I can't shut my brain off and I have to think about this and I have to think through this. So just try and get perspective from people in your industry, but also, you know, your mom and your best friend from, you know, grammar school. I was talking to her the other day and she gave me a great idea that I hadn't even thought about because it's, she's outside of my sphere of influence, right? So, um, so really having a tribe of people that you can go to and because we're at a women's conference it does typically tend to be your your women you know women and and to kind of put a, another spin on what we talked about earlier working in technology is a very male dominated field so the bright spots are the women that you meet along the way are very supportive and look to sponsor you and try to kind of get involved because they also know it can be tough too mm -hmm. so just like you work in finance or anything else it's it's almost like a double bonus that um, you know, there are kind of ways that you can get networked and involved. So I would say personal board of advisors for sure. Um, and it doesn't have to be anything formal, although I would prefer to do like a board meeting in Maui or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> get there. Sounds like right now it's just kind of like, can we go for a glass of wine? I need to pick your brain about yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, Mary, and how about you? Uh, you know, guidance and inspiration. Well, I try and find it everywhere. And you usually do because, you know, you, you see what you're looking for usually. Um, my kids, Paul, uh, Nancy, um, other people in my life, but um, believe it or not, and you, you probably will believe this because you spent the last 40 minutes with me, but um, David Bowie is a huge influence, um, and for a lot of reasons, but the one reason is that once he became successful at something, he never did it again, and I just think that's incredibly powerful. Um, to Patti Smith. Um, because in a male-dominated world, thank you very much. Um, you know, I mean, she's the godmother of, of punk rock, and, and now she's, you know, talking and accepting, you know, Nobel Peace Prizes for Bob Dylan. Who would have thought back in CBGBs that, that she would be? So she's an inspiration. Um, and the Ramones, believe it or not. The Ramones, um, you know, punk rock started yeah. in New York City, and it was the Ramones going to London and completely disrupting that scene that led to, well, a lot of the music, believe it or not, that we listen to today. So I, I wanted to be a rock and roll star. That was my real dream. <laughs> Obviously, that didn't happen. I have not a single shred of talent, but I married a musician. Um, but so I do, I look to that as a source of pretty much constant um, inspiration. So we have just a couple minutes, but are there any questions? So talking about the peaks and the valleys of your sales and consultancy and client-driven, 
what are your strategies for a dealing with cash flow management issues? Um, how do you guys personally deal with, or your company deal with that? And also, have you found any sales tactics that are better or worse? Is it word of mouth? Is it social media marketing? Like, what what have you guys found to be like a unnecessary? getting sales because obviously none of us could go out on our own without getting so, the next. So, so sales strategy to live through and maybe smooth out some of the peaks and valleys. Mm -hmm. oh, peaks and valleys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that was a huge learning curve for us because you think everyone's going to pay on time and you'll get this mm -hmm. percentage of it and then as the business changes you realize none of that ever happens. So um, <laughs> save as much as, as you can and just have a cushion in the in the business. It's that the larger you get, the bigger that cushion has to be. Um, have really strict payment terms and follow up on them. We mm -hmm. um, have been to court with three clients who haven't paid. Um, we won. And <laughs> um, I have been paid. So, and um, I think just be flexible with your lifestyle. So I, last year, um, we de we had like one or two months where things just didn't align and it meant I got paid very little and um, you know I don't have kids I don't have major uh, responsibilities so it's less stressful for me but um, you just adjust your life that month and plan accordingly for the future months and now we kind of know we need to make X amount and that means we can afford this much on contractors and this much on our expenses and X Y Z and that means we need this many clients um, for how we get clients. Uh, when I left Goop, I sent an email to every single person I had worked with, which was about 500 people, and said, I'm going to be consulting. Let me know if you need anything. And um, we got a ton of clients from that. So we actually have never pitched a client. They have all come to us through word of mouth. Um, so don't burn bridges. <laughs> Everybody talks. Um, and find those people where you have a mutually beneficial relationship. So we have certain vendors where they need people on their system and our clients are those people and then we need more clients. So they will hear from their current users um, who could use uh, digital marketing support. Um, we have a lot of ad sales um, people. People in ad sales always need to be giving like great solutions and getting more traffic to those sites so that they can um, sell them. So that's where we come in. We get a ton of leads through there. So it's kind of figuring out who you can <coughs> not pay to get <laughs> to get you business, but mm -hmm. leverage their network. Mm -hmm. So Siobhan, I see you shaking your head in agreement with nearly all of what Emily said. Anything <laughs> I'm just different? Very supportive panelists. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Is there anything <laughs> different though that you would, you would say? No, I would say word of mouth definitely, and and in technology, people tend to move around quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So if you were a client with them, you, you know, I would, I use LinkedIn a lot, right, to congratulate people on a new job or whatever, but then you can kind of say, oh, they moved here, and I can pitch them on the same thing, the same project that I, because usually people need the same, uh, from a marketing standpoint, they need the same help, right? Um, as far as the peaks and the valleys go, um, I've, uh, with some, with mixed success, getting my, some money up front can help too. So by saying, you know, to secure this proposal, 50% up front or be able, and then when they push back, say, you know, I need to plan my business and here's why. And I find clients to be really pretty, maybe I'm just very lucky, to be really receptive about, if, if you have a why and it's a good why, I find that they can, you know, they'll say, oh, well, maybe I can work that with legal another mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. So um, so try and get money up front. Try not to pay for anything until you know that, um, that you're going to get paid on the back end. But that was a big learning. I just... I didn't know that you couldn't like pay bills, and then people were <laughs> yeah, like, "Oh yeah, that that, no, acceptable. we don't." You know, that's yeah. and that's a strategy on their end, right? Yeah. So on the corporate side, they're trying to stretch that out as long as yeah. possible. So, um, but I think it's yeah, it's a it's a good conversation to have up front. Marion, anything different? No, I, I would say the same thing. Even in nonprofit world, and especially relying on government funding, there's been times when up. Oh, that, that budget wasn't passed, you know, we're in that situation here in Pennsylvania, and it gets, it gets a little tight. So we strategically um, stay very small um, and very agile so that we can say, okay, well, maybe we don't need to use that particular contractor this month. Um, let's see what the next quarter is going to look like. Um, we don't invest in, in buildings or anything like that. You know, you guys, the same thing. So as much of the work that can be virtual, we do that. We support a mobile workforce. 
um, and are always trying to look at you know, innovations in, in that regard so that we keep those kind of indirect costs um, as low as we can. So we are actually over time, right? Uh, so the panelists will be here if you have individual questions that you'd like to ask. But how about we thank Emily, Siobhan, and Mary.